we have the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Fire, fire evacuation procedures in the event of emergency, we could exit the door in the back or the door to my left down the stairs and away from the building. Roll call, please. Donna Corbin Savinsky. Here. Virginia Hickley. Here. Robert Henderson. Here. Kevin Zorda. Here. Phil Coburn. Here. Ann Collins. Here. Nancy Martin. Here. Okay, thank you. Uh, public participation. Is there anybody in the audience wishing to speak on items not on the agenda? Anybody wishing to speak on items not on the agenda? One last time. Items. Anybody want to speak with items not on the agenda? Moving forward. Agent correspondence. We received um, an email regarding the uh, annual conference Saturday, October 29th. We were supposed to get our picks in to Jennifer McKenzie yesterday. Mm -hmm. So hopefully people did that. Um, we also have a, from the, um, Georgia gave us a sheet talking about site walks. Okay, uh, approval of minutes from September 20th. I will make a motion to table the approval of the minutes since uh, we only received half of the pages in our packet and the rest tonight so we can review those. Okay. Second. Uh, roll call. Donna Corbin Savinsky. Yes. Virginia Higley. Yes. Robert Hendrickson. Yes. Kevin Zorda. Yes. Phil Kober. Yes. Ann Collins. Yes. Nancy Martin. Yes. Seven in favor. Motion passes. Uh, we received a town attorney report dated September 28th um, regarding the cases in litigation. Um, we have no continued public hearings. We have no new public hearings. We're now on old business. IW 665, 274, 284, and 242 Brainerd Road. The last meeting we tabled it. I have a motion to remove from the table. I'll make a motion to remove IW number 665 from the table. Second. Jenny. Any discussion? Uh, roll call. Donna Corbin Savinsky. Yes. Virginia Higley. Yes. Robert Hendrickson. Yes. Kevin Zorda. Yes. Phil Kober. Yes. Ann Collins. Yes. Nancy Martin. Yes. Okay, before we start, uh, gentlemen, you can come to the desk. <coughs> before we start, I want to um, read an email, or maybe Ginny or Georgie could do it because <laughs> my voice isn't too well today. But there was an email that was sent out um, to the, the agency, and I believe we should read it into the record regarding this application. Which part do you want there? The whole thing. Should I start from the back? Yeah, yeah, start from the back, please. Okay. I believe, gentlemen, you received a copy of the email as well. Okay, I'm starting from the back. Thank you. Uh, this was from um, Jessica of the uh, Connecticut Water. No, no, no. No, no. I got the this, wrong one. You got no. the wrong one. You got this one here. This is the back. I got his. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay. This is from Phil Kober uh, to Georgie Driver. Uh, <coughs> it was CC to Donna, Kevin, myself, uh, Robert Hendrickson, uh, Nancy Martin, Sean Dean. Ann Collins, and it was, uh, good evening, Georgie. Can you reach out to the applicant slash owner for this application to request an agency site walk? <coughs> Ideally, I would like to accomplish this next week to have notes for our next meeting. Next week, I have some availability as follows, 927, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., Nine, oh, excuse me, that was 9.26, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. 9.27, 3.30 p.m. to dusk. 9.28, 4 p.m. to dusk. And on 9.30, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. The rest of the agency is included in the CC line. 
If anyone else is interested and available, please respond for planning. If another member cannot make it, please let me know if our CEO or another member of the town staff can tag along so we have our recommended participation of at least two going out. And then from... This one, yeah, so right above. Right above it. Right above. I know, but it doesn't start out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't. starts it's out. Here. I know. Oh, okay. Then it says on Friday, September 23rd, Georgie wrote, Good, e good morning, Phil. I believe in order to request a site walk, you have to do during the meeting with the applicant and select a date slash time. Let me verify this with Lori and I'll get back to you all. And then the next one is from Ann Collins, and she said and it's to Georgie. And she's the subject was a request for site walk. Hello, Georgina. I totally agree that a site walk is needed to access the situation, to assess the situation, excuse me, and protect the town's itself interest. Hmm. I am available for the same times as Phil and for any other times that are convenient for other <coughs> Inland Wetland Watercourse Agency members. Yours. And then the next one is from Georgie, and it was to uh, Donna and the members of the committee, and it was regarding Inland Wetlands 665 request for site walk. Uh, it starts out, caution external email. This email originated outside of WSU. Do not click links, open attachments, or respond if it appears to be suspicious. And then she goes on to say, Hi, everyone. Here is the protocol for site walks. The commission can go out individually or in groups of two, just no quorum. If you go to the site, you must report your findings to the commission on 10-4, or you can wait to discuss a site walk with the applicant for the entire commission, in which case it would also be open to the public. No discussion would be allowed. I do want you all to keep in mind that this site was previously approved already in 2005. I will put the original file so you can have it for your examination. Oh, excuse me. She said I will pull the original file so you can have it for your examination. The reason why the applicants are here today is only because the permit expired. I also want to point out that we had had other projects with much more impact on wetlands. For example, 3032 Bacon Road, not Wynn Stanley. And we did not do a site walk nor a public hearing. Of course, that decision is yours as a commission. I will be in the office on the 29th. Thank you, Georgie. And then... <clears throat> Okay, on Friday, September 23rd, Phil Kober wrote, right. Thanks, Georgie et al. I still am in favor of a site walk at minimum on this application for at least the following key reasons. The town GIS on property 284 shows the wetland soil higher, and in parentheses, more north, close parentheses, in the property, which, if true, would have a UPRA covering much more of the project. The replotting of wetland A, which they believe is that same soil, is pushed further south, thus taking a lot of this outside of our jurisdiction. This can be treated as a map amendment, which should trigger an auto public hearing, but that's another consideration. The plans, as is shown, disturbance of 50% of what they designated as wetland A in its entirety and the building slash disturbance of essentially three structures in the 100-foot upland review area. Um, it seems the agency and the applicant are hoping for a final action on 10-4, delaying a site walk request to then either means another continuance or at minimum a motion to approve this wouldn't be unanimous. On another note, we should consider incorporating site walk procedures in the municipal regulations we have. The latest April 21st, 2020 doesn't even have the phrase in it. This leaves to work with the state law and case law on the subject. Moreover, our current bylaws say 
we will treat site walks as a special meeting. This means we can take a quorum out there, if so desired, since minutes need to be recorded anyway. No quorum would mean no legal meeting, although we all recognize a site walk as a proceeding that is open to the public, parentheses, but where they cannot come in close parentheses, regardless of quorum, parentheses, Grimes versus Conservation Commission, open parentheses, 1996, close parentheses, and CLOW versus IWWC, Sharon, parentheses, 2005, close parentheses, and well as Davis versus IWWC, Naugatuck, parentheses, 1998, close parentheses, close parentheses. So for any site walk we do, we owe minutes within 48 hours to comply with Connecticut FOIA on a special meeting and then full site walk report is still included in the next regular meeting. And then, look at in there. Okay, yep. This is from Donna Corbin Savinsky, and she, it was to Georgina Driver with a copy to all the um, commission members. And of course, it has the disclaimer on the caution about external email. As a reminder, we should not be discussing applications and emails. They should only be discussed during a meeting. The information below needs to be brought forward and discussed at the next meeting. Thank you, Donna, Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Agency Chair. And then from Phil Kober to Donna Corbin Sabinski with a copy to the members. Uh, yes, that's correct. This change started as discussion about a schedule and or agenda for a meeting slash hearing slash proceeding, which in and of itself is exempt from disclosure. Moving into discussion on the decision making process should make it public. Georgie, please print this chain to include this as agent correspondence at the next regular meeting. That aside, we still have parentheses, at least close parentheses, two members interested in a site walk, which does not require majority member agency action per existing statute, case law, and our own bylaws. Can staff please schedule as originally requested and send the agenda when ready? From Georgina Driver to Phil Kober with a copy to all the members. Hi, please refrain from stating reasons of anything about anything on a pending application and email. Code of ethics must be followed, no ex parte communication. Like I said, commissioners can go separately. This does not require a separate agenda or anything. Phil and Anne, feel free to go to the site by yourselves if you'd like. As for a full on commission site walk, this needs to be discussed with the applicant on 10-4. Thank you, Georgie. Um, <clears throat> and we go to Donna Corbin Sabinski to the town attorney with a copy to Donna, Georgina, Lori Witten, Kevin Zorda. Subject code of ethics. Hi, please see the email chain below. I would like to have Phil sent a letter regarding the uh, Code of Ethics to show the Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Agency does not tolerate this type of behavior. He recently attended the FOI meetings with the Town Attorney's Office on September 15th, and I believe has completed the Inland Wetland Watercourse Agency training. He was also on the Ethics Commission from 2016 through 2020. We cannot have these types of discussions in emails and any other place except for our meetings, which I have stated many times during meetings. Also, the email chain below will be discussed, excuse me, will be disclosed at our next meeting with the applicants present on 10-4. That's because the applicants were included in some of the emails. And then the final one is from Lori Witten, and it's to John Petronella, Dana Steele, Frank Triano, Phil Kober, Donna Corbin Sabinski, Georgina Driver, um, Ellen Zappo, and the town attorney. And it says, hello, John, Frank, and Dana. We want you to be aware that there has been an email chain from Inland Wetlands Commissioner Phil Kober 
to staff and the commission discussing issues related to your application. Chair Corbin Sabinski wants us to make sure the applicant was aware of the email chain. We feel that this has stepped over the line under FOIA and want to provide full disclosure. Please see below for the email chain. Also, please feel free to contact myself or Georgie, and then it gives Georgie's telephone number, with any questions or concerns, and it's signed Lori Witten. Thank you. Thank you for reading that, gentlemen. Um, so now that you heard that, <laughs> would you like Phil to recuse himself from the rest of the meeting for your application? It's your call. Actually, um, Frank Triano, applicant, mm -hmm. one of the applicants. Uh, at this time, the answer is no. We appreciate it. We, we appreciate us doing the walkthrough. We, um, we're happy to provide as much information as possible for what mm -hmm. we feel is a very f positive application for the town of Enfield. Um, we, we engaged Dana to do the walkthrough, um, and we think it actually helped probably a lot of the information that may not have been understood in the mm -hmm. first application. We've certainly addressed many of the issues that came up, like the Connecticut water, but we'll be happy to have uh, Mr. Cobra stay, and we appreciate his input of what he actually found on the site, which we think was actually something that was enlightening, mm -hmm. that sometimes you don't see on a map, mm -hmm. and sometimes you do do a walkthrough. I, I think one of his comments that I think I read in one of the messages, it might be more clear, um, because I did get involved in some of these messages, mm -hmm. um, not all all of them, as you mentioned, but right. I think it was very important for clarifying what a walkthrough does, because I think sometimes, and maybe in this case, it would be very helpful to have an actual hands-on view, and sometimes you cannot see it all from a piece of paper or even a video or a screen. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're happy to have him stay, and we appreciate his input. Okay, thank you. It was your call. <laughs> <coughs> Madam Chair, if I could just raise a point of order. So I do appreciate that from the applicant. Um, I do just want to state for the record, I'm pretty sure um, our code of ethics and our bylaws state that recusal is a decision of the commissioner, not necessarily the applicant. So I just kind of want to state that. Once again, I do appreciate your input. Um, again, I do probably apologize for the theatrics of this. Um, as you guys probably determined from the email, it was largely procedural. Um, there was nothing new that was raised. I think it was the consultant last meeting that had mentioned the wetland delineation movement. So um, once again, I just wanted to state that for the record. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not gonna discuss that now, but um, okay. So we did get the, um, at the last meeting, we ended with the Connecticut water letter. I would let you go back and review that. Did you have any updates on that? Sure. Uh, for the record, Dana Steele, uh, professional engineer with J.R. Russo. Um, with me, uh, George Logan from Rima Ecological Services, our soil scientist, uh, and you already heard from Frank Triano. Uh, the, as you mentioned, the last meeting, uh, one of the main reasons why you decided to table it was because we had just gotten this water company letter at the last minute, and you wanted us to have time to review it and to be able to provide thoughtful response. Um, we went back and forth on whether to submit a revised plan to you to and try to incorporate some of these uh, comments from the water company. And ultimately, after going back and forth on that, we decided that, that these, these comments are really more uh, relevant to um, the Planning and Zoning Commission than to the Wetlands Commission. And while we do intend to address them, uh, we felt it was better to uh, wait until we actually have an application before Planning, planning and Zoning to, to do that. Um, that being said, the reason why, one of the reasons why, even though the commi Commission, I think, understood that and acknowledged that, was like, but if you make changes to address the <laughs> aquifer and that impacts your wet, your regulated areas, then what 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 what's going to happen then? You have to come come back and and we want, you'd like to avoid that. We'd like to avoid that. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in thinking that through, um, I thought uh, uh, the best thing to do was to to go through the letter and explain to you how uh, we intend to address each of these these comments. And we believe that uh, that these. Uh, comments uh, once addressed will not have an impact on the wetland application, would not require us uh, to come back uh, be, be before you. So that's why uh, we took the approach uh, that, that we did. We did, uh, though, submit uh, some additional documents uh, that uh, you should have gotten through staff uh, from uh, George Logan. Um, you had asked for a little more detail regarding the wetland mitigation, mm -hmm. this, uh, this green triangle, dark green triangle on the plans, yeah. on this color plan. Uh, that's area that's compensating for the, the red area, which is the area of wetland disturbance in, in wetland A, um, which 
by the way, we're just to reiterate, we're only proposing to disturb about half of that, that wetland, A. The other half is remaining. Uh, and so just that red portion compensated by this, uh, this larger uh, green area. And, and we even discussed um, whether we could expand that green area further. And, uh, and we, we took a look at that, and we, we, we actually came up with a plan to, uh, to, uh, to expand that to, and I think in George's report here, it says 6375 square feet. So we, if, if, you, if you would like to see a, a, an even larger mitigation area, we've confirmed we can do it. So uh, we'd be happy to uh, submit to that as a, as a condition if you'd like to see that enlarged to that, that larger area. Right, right, right now, we're providing about a ratio about one and a half to one uh, disturbance to replication. And that would bring us close to three to one mm -hmm. uh, with that that, that larger um, uh, uh, area. So let me get to the uh, the the uh, Connecticut Water Company comments, and then I'll let George explain in more detail the the documents that he submitted. Mm -hmm. So um, we received uh, this this letter to Georgina Driver from uh, Connecticut Water, uh, dated September twentieth, two thousand twenty two. Uh, the first page of the, of the letter is just an introduction and explaining the importance of the aquifer and uh, doesn't provide any specific uh, requests or, or recommendations. But uh, just towards uh, the end, they begin getting to this recommendation for no direct discharge to, to the aquifer. What that relates to is the stormwater system for the uh, um, for the upper portion of the site, the northern portion of the site that, that fronts on George Washington and Brainerd Road, discharges to a subsurface detention system in the lawn area here behind this last unit, and, and then uh, into the, um, the drainage system in George Washington Road. However, the system was designed with the option to have an open bottom, which means that that water could go directly into the, in, into the ground rather than being piped uh, toward, uh, down the road where it eventually discharges into uh, St. Martha's Pond. Um, and so the, the comment they're making is they don't want any, dis any discharge into the, into the ground there. We had anticipated that because that was the, I think the position of the, of the Connecticut Water Company last time when, when we came in. So this doesn't surprise us that they said this. Um, and so we had provisions already in the plan to, to line it so that there would be no discharge. So uh, in the, um, the, the second page of, of, the, of the letter, the first paragraph, they talk about uh, uh, options for redoing this, this drainage. Uh, and one involves uh, converting to an open basin. Um, and this, this area, all this portion here is well outside of your regulated area. So we felt that, that um, it really uh, is something that we're going to address when we go to planning and zoning and look at what can we do to provide some open basin type of solutions to uh, complement and, and enhance what, what, what we're proposing here. So uh, we'll be uh, addressing that so when we, when we submit uh, at a later time to, to planning and zoning. Uh, so that's that first paragraph. And, and by the way, it does mention the idea of an impermeable layer as another option if an open basin is not feasible. So uh, just to point that out. Then second, the second one is they want a what they call a gross particle separator. Uh, um, and, uh, and this uh, gross particle separator is a structural chamber, kind of like a, sept a septic tank uh, that takes the water and separates out grit and oils before continuing down the line. Uh, we do have one in the upper system, but we don't have one in the lower system where the wetlands are. And they're saying we'd like it in both in, in, in both systems. Um, I, I reached out to the to the water company about that, um, pushing back a little and saying, why do we need a, a grid separator? We've already we're already proposing uh, a, a a stormwater BMP, a, a wet pond, a four bay. Uh, we're providing the required pretreatment. This is really like above and beyond uh, what what would uh, typically be required. They responded back, basically saying we still would like to see it. So <laughs> that was their 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 response. Um, so so we talked about whether to put that into this plan or not. That separator will be located here between these two units at the end, so well out of any regulated area. So even if we put it in, it's really not in, 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 in a regulated area, um, an, an area that's, that's already uh, disturbed by, by, by development. Uh, number three in that same paragraph, they're asking for deep sump catch basins and hoods. 
in all the catch basins. So we had talked to them about, well, what if we just put one on the last structure? Do we really need them on all the structures? How much additional benefit are we really providing to do on all this? I think there's six catch basins in this lower, uh, this lower horseshoe here of, uh, that drains down towards uh, the wetland areas. Again, their response was, yeah, we'd still think it'd be better to have it, have it on, on all of them. So we didn't get very far with, with that um, uh, discussion. But um, again, uh, these catch basins are all outside of the, the regulated area. So if we put them in, uh, if planning and zoning says, yeah, we want you to put them in, then we'll put them in. I don't think it has any impact on, on whatever permit you, you, you issue. But uh, so that, that, that was our thinking there. Uh, moving down to the third paragraph on page two, uh, there's two more items that are brought up. The first one is regarding uh, roof leader dry wells. Uh, we are proposing on the plan that we have already submitted to you uh, to propose infiltration dry wells for each roof uh, downspout. Uh, so typically on a house, on houses like these, you'd have one at each corner uh, of, of the house. And so each one would have one subsurface chamber. Um, uh, they're, they're like, four feet by two feet in, in, in dimensions. And, uh, and so they, there's room to put them off of each corner. We don't show them on the plan. The reason is because we had a note saying, if the soils are suitable. And we haven't gone out and dug holes in every single location where we're gonna put one of these. And if you dig one and you find that the soils aren't any good, uh, high water table or, a, or, or, or tight soils, and it's just not going to provide any benefit. Uh, we're saying that that you, you wouldn't you wouldn't put them in there. You, you put them in where it makes sense to put them in, and so um, so the water company says, "Yep, we agree. That makes perfect sense. We just like you to show them on the plan where they could be." Um, so we so so we haven't done that, um, but but as you can see, they're, they'd all be close to the corners of these houses. All the houses are outside of the regulated area too, except for these three units, which are in within the regulated area of wetland A. So on those, yes, those would be within, technically within the regulated area, but they're in the lawn areas that were already disturbing. They're subsurface, it, you know, the, really, it's it's just a good thing. It, it's not it's not a bad thing. It's not a, an impact. It's actually um, just a, in, a an improvement or, or a benefit. So, um, so, so we didn't feel that that those units was kind of you kind of picture in your mind where they're going to be. They're right. They're right in the corners of the of the units, and we you could double them up if one corner wasn't good. You could try to put two in in one corner, and that's really going to be a construction decision at the time that they're out there and really investigating. So I'll go out and I'll look at them and I'll make a determination and discuss it with staff, whoever needs to to sign off on that uh, before we make a decision. So uh, that's the, uh, the, the, the roof, the, the roof uh, dry wells. They said, all right, we, we know you're already proposing them. Just could you show them on the plans? Yeah, yeah, we could. Um, uh, but uh, it's really not going to change what the Wellens Commission does, was my thought. Uh, the last part in that same paragraph, um, they asked regarding the yard drains, which are in behind behind the units uh, in, in this area. Uh, there's also some yard drains in the in the northern portion, but the portion that drains to the wetlands here, there are some 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 yard drains behind these units that drain down and come into this this, this stormwater basin, and they're asking that they uh, that they be perforated piping. Well, the the roof the the. Um, the footing drains are already perforated. Their, their, their job is to take water away from the foundations. Um, and the plans already show perforated piping between the yard drains. Uh, the, the only area where, where there was not perforations was between uh, the, the connecting pipes between the footing drains getting to the yard drains. And I explained, that, I explained to them that we really don't want to do that because we're trying to get the water away. And the reality is that footing drains don't have any water flowing in them unless the water table is high. And if the water table is high, then putting perforations in the pipe is not going to do any good. It's just going to it's sitting in water. So it's really not going to, uh, the, what, what, what works is gravity. So, so they're, they're, the, the pipes are sloped so that they, so they, 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 they drain away. So, um, so uh, I, I believe we've actually already addressed this comment because our plans do show perforated piping between between the yard drains, and I think that that's that's what's uh, appropriate. But again, that's for planning and zoning. I think to tell us whether they want us to do more or do something different. 
Excuse me, Chair. I just want to clarify, because I'm also the Aquifer Protection Agent for Enfield. Um, even though wetlands is known to help with pollution and toxins that enter the ground, um, having these APA guidelines from CT Water is more of a best management practice just to ensure that as much, like, all the rainwater that's being discharged to site is as clean as can possibly be. So that's, like, the purpose of it. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you. Georgie. Uh, so the next paragraph in the le letter on page two is talking about wetland A. And that's probably the most significant to what to what you're considering uh, uh, this evening. Uh, they're uh, pointing out that we are disturbing some wetlands. And their comment is just, you shouldn't disturb wetlands, basically. That's what they're saying. Wetlands are good. You shouldn't disturb wetlands. Uh, and um, and uh, uh, but, but we are um, proposing uh, to disturb approximately half of this of this isolated wetland, um, uh, which has very limited value function, as as George uh, mentioned in, in his presentation last week, uh, and in mitigation for that, we're proposing to provide even more. So all of the things that they're saying wetlands are good for, we're providing that with with a multiplier. We're providing even more. So. Um, it's not that what they're saying is wrong. It's 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 that we have accounted for it and mitigated it. And as um, as Jessica uh, said to me on the phone when I was talking to her, um, it's it's the commission's decision, and they, and so they recognize that they and are suggestions. They're not requirements. Yeah, they're just they're just pointing out that generally you don't want to disturb wetlands because wetlands have value. They have they have they have value. In, and we believe that we are mitigating that uh, by providing something even better than what is, is there now, um, enhancing an area that's really of greater significance and greater value. And uh, as George mentioned in, in his report, referring to that 6,375 square feet of potential mitigation area, we could expand this green area even further. And so if you'd like to see us do that, uh, if you're happy with the way it is, that you can improve it that way. If you'd like to see it expanded to the 6375, we've confirmed that that can be done uh, by by simply expanding it to to the to the east here, expanding that green area to the east. We won't be encroaching closer to wetland W. Uh, we won't be changing. We won't be doing any more activity within a regulated area. This uh, this black line you see you see around the wetland. That's the the 100 foot 100 foot regulated area around around the wetlands. Uh, and so we're we're not even in uh, that 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 area. So uh, that is uh, number six. The next paragraph um, deals with best management practices during construction, and there's really three three recommendations in there. One regarding maintenance and fueling of construction vehicles. Don't do that uh, within within the aquifer area unless unless you absolutely have to. Obviously, if it runs out of gas. You might have to bring uh, something in. And they say, if, if necessary, you put a mat down, you put containment down before you do that filling so that if anything spills. I mean, diesel fuel is expensive. Nobody wants to spill it. Um, but it, accidents do happen. And so you need that, those pr protections to, um, to make sure that it doesn't get into the ground. So um, uh, that's number seven. Uh, number eight, uh, chemicals uh, have to be stored in, in safe containers so they don't leak, don't spill. There won't be any chemicals stored uh, on, on, on this site. There's no reason to have chemicals stored on this site. So uh, that won't be a problem. Uh, and then number nine, a spill response plan should be submitted uh, 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 and, in, and include the town in that spill response plan, which, which um, uh, we're required to do through our DEEP uh, stormwater permit anyway. So when we submit that after our local approvals, it'll, it, will it will include that. Uh, so so we, we feel that, uh, um, that those uh, um, uh, measures can be uh, uh, addressed uh, through uh, notes on the plan, which are part, will be part of our planning and zoning ap application to have notes on, on all, all of those things. Um, moving to the last page of the, of the report then, um, the 10th item was regarding salt. Uh, basically, no salt. No salt for, for, for winter de-icing. Uh, so um, that is already uh, a note on our plans uh, and already a note in the uh, maintenance schedule, which is included at the end of my drainage report. Um, and uh, when we submit to planning and zoning, we will also 
put it more predominantly so that it's that it's uh, super abundantly clear, no salt. Um, and that's going to this is going to be controlled by a homeowners association that's responsible for maintaining these roads and and abiding by that requirement. And they maintain the driveways too, I think, don't they? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So driveways they're... and the and the roads. Yep. Yeah. And the sidewalks. Uh, last item is. Uh, um, sort of a, just a general comment recommendation that, that we should minimize lawn areas um, to reduce the amount of fe uh, fertilizers and pesticides. The thinking is if you leave more areas natural, wooded, you don't put pesticides and, and fertilizers in areas that are just natural. Um, and so if you can have as little of those lawn areas as possible, then, um, then that, that's good. I don't know. You, you all live in houses. You can look at the at, at the houses on these lots and look at the amount of green space that's around these houses. We've tried to provide a reasonable amount. I don't think we've, we have excessive sprawling lawns on this uh, on on this project. So I, I don't think that this was a criticism comment. It was simply stating so that so that um, uh, those that would make decisions about this issue can look at it and decide whether we have or not. And and if not, tell us that we need to shrink them, make them, make them even smaller than, than we have. We think that, that it's appropriate what, what we're proposing. So, so that's a summary um, of the comments. Uh, um, and uh, I, I hope I've been able to explain why I felt that we didn't need to submit a revised plan, that we will address these, but it'll come at the next step of this, of this process, if you're comfortable with that. Um, any, any questions about the aquifer comments before I hand it over to George to talk about nope. the documents he submitted? You so go. you'd be willing to put it in a, a site-specific condition um, that final plans will show increased wetland mitigation area? Yes, of So, George Logan, for the record, Rima Ecological Services, registered soil scientist, professional wetland scientist. So, the documents that I provided were, did a couple of things. One, as I mentioned the last time, um, I wanted to provide, and I think you, this is what you requested, specific details of how one goes about to do a wetland mitigation. I can do it with my eyes closed. <laughs> But I think it's always good to be able to point this to the landscaper and say, um, please, could you look at page one? Specifically, it says all wetland replication work should be supervised by an ecologist, a wetland scientist. That's the big one. And so usually I put that in the front page. It's right there. And I put a box around it. Big box, yeah. And uh, sometimes I even bold it, but I did this time. And that's the big one. In my experience, that's that's the one that if I'm not involved, things can go haywire, and then we're just chasing our tail um, and trying to remediate. Um, the rest of, of these notes are pretty much yeah. the what you would expect: yeah. Yeah. Uh, preparation, the earthwork, uh, the plantings, all the things that any competent landscaper would know about already. But the last page, which is four and five, the last two pages also include things that um, are, are important. Uh, there's, uh, for instance, there's an invasive plant control, which lasts for two years following. Four? Uh, uh, yes, four, following the, uh, the year of implementation. So that would be uh, basically year two and three. Um, and then, of course, we have in the, in the final page monitoring. And this is happening again for um, uh, in the first year, depending on when we're doing it. There's one or two times that I would be out there or someone like myself will be out there following installation to see if the, the tra trajectory, if you will, of the wetland mitigation is, is going right. 
for instance, what if we have, um, you know, like what we had this year, <laughs> which is, you know, a drought, a moderate drought. Sometimes what happens with that is that um, annuals, because the water is further down, annuals just start proliferating and our wetland plants are not doing too well. So we need to kind of take care of something um, of that, whether it's whether it's water or whether, you know, I come in and say, okay, uh, this didn't work, we need to do A, B, and C. And then, of course, we have two years following uh, the next two growing seasons. And you can see there under three competing plants, sometimes we, we pull them. Very often, if we, if we have a particularly wet season and we have more water, uh, what that can do is we can have cattails start coming in. Mm -hmm. And we don't have anything against cattails, but if you let cattails take a hold, um, they can basically, your diversity of vegetation goes down the drain. It's great for water quality control, but this is not for water quality. So, you know, we will come in and, and remove them, as I say, by hoeing or hand pulling, and we do that often, just to let all the other vegetation mature, and then, you know, there's good competition. Um, and then a, a brief report as submitted by November 30th of the monitoring year. So that's kind of running through these, and these are notes that I've developed or we have developed in our company over probably the last 15 or 20 years. We adjust them according to what the specific specification is. Um, for instance, if we're doing work for the MDC, they have standards and we have to incorporate those standards. And here, which comes down to doing soil tests and testing for this and testing for that. I don't think it's necessary for this particular case. I think we have um, the right amount, the, the right kinds of soils here. And then the tables that I provided, these were um, revised to accommodate the idea that we would go, if necessary, to the 6375. Um, so you, there's more plants here than, uh, than before. What you will see is that there are 74 shrubs. And because the idea, as you see from the first page of the implementation notes, I give you um, sort of an idea of what, um, what I'm expecting here. And so I'm expecting to get basically have an emergent wetland, but with shrub clusters surrounding it. Uh, although, if you see under table one, and you go down and you see spirea latifolia, which is meadow sweet, uh, that usually is because they they don't grow very large. Uh, those are usually within the emergent wetland, not not surrounding it. Even though it's a facultative species, uh, and some of these these others are facultative wet. So those are the shrubs, 74, and then um, you see there the. The, the propagules. The reason you see them in 50s is because they come in trays of 50s. So um, it usually that's the way they go. Now, uh, if I was proposing, for instance, something larger, then it would be a, a single pot. But usually we go with the plugs. Um, and these, when I say two inch plugs, don't, don't imagine that something that's this big. The plug in, is two inches, but then the vegetation that's growing from it could be a foot depending on which time of the year we're, we're getting it from the uh, from our supplier. And that's the kind of species that you would see in a, in a wet meadow. Um, the one thing that I did not tell you here, and I, probably I'll tell it on the record, but this is something that I would do anyhow. Um, when you first start a wetland mitigation area, you just don't plant everything and go see you later. There's a few things that cultural practices you have to do, particularly for a meadow. And what it is, depending on the time of the year that you're they're doing it, even this could spill over to year number two, is you don't just let them go, you mow them. And you're like, well, why? And it increases vigor. So for instance, um, depending if we, on year two, because let's say most of the times these propagules go in in the springtime, we don't want to put them in the summer because for obvious reasons. Um, 
So past, say, July 15th, you don't plant them uh, because you, you need them to grow. And if you're going into summer, obviously, that's, that's not a good time for these things to grow. But year two, we come back and we mow everything, except for the shrubs. <laughs> we mow everything within six inches of the ground in late June. And what that does, it forces the plant to regrow so that by the end of the summer, it's full growth and, and it can go to seed. But what you've done is you've increased its vigor. And you do that only one, one time, but you could also do it the second year too. And that will be even, even better. So these are some of the things that we've, uh, we've discovered and we do over the, over the years. And um, table, hmm, I, I did not correct it. Remember we had two table oh, yeah, twos? Yeah. Ay, ay, ay. So this is table three or table two, two. Uh, <laughs> two dash two. <laughs> uh, the seed mixes, obviously the seed mixes, you can see there they've gone up in the amounts. And we have for the detention basin, which we've also discussed, and then for the wetland replication area, um, we've gone from two, I think, pounds to three pounds. And the one thing that I'll tell you is that the, the and I've, I've tested this, the New England wet mix, even though it's a great mix, it doesn't do much at all the first year. The first year, what you see is a few species that are there that are more of the Graminaceae, the, the grasses, will pop up and everything else is kind of sitting there going, okay, our turn next year. So it takes a year. And, and part of the reason is because there's so much demand for this, for this that they don't, for a lot of the seed, it does not allow it to go into cold stratification over the winter. And so it, it needs the winter. the winter once you put them in the ground and then they, they do fine after that. Um, so there, there you have it. That's kind of, kind of a rundown of some of the things that I've included in the wetland mitigation. And note on page one is the most important one. Thank you. You're welcome. I think that's uh, all we have to present. So we'll take any questions you have. Okay. Um, <coughs> Phil and Ann, you did do a site walk. So if you want to give your personal comments on. Yeah, thank you. So just a question. Did the, I don't think it's necessary probably to read the full minutes of the site walk, but do we know, did you guys get a copy of the notes by any chance? No. Okay. So um, if we just make sure that they get a copy, I don't think there's anything significant, um, you know, and obviously I'll, you know, I'll highlight um, there was two of us from the agency that went out there, uh, Mr. Steele, and then one of his survey techs. Um, so. I basically drafted a map taken from the applicant to show the route we walked. Um, and then obviously the incidental discussion we had was verifying where we were, where we were going, and where we still on the property. Um, so that's basically the key conversation points. We observed some no trespassing signs, um, things of that nature. And we we're trying to go by the site plans to make sure we were, we were on the site the entire time. Um, so you know, nothing out of the ordinary was found or observed. Obviously, it was some thick forest we were going through, so it did take some while to tread through there. Um, we did locate wetlands A and W. Um, they were fully flagged, um, and they corresponded to the applicant's plans. Um, so the only follow-up questions, and I don't know if I want to bring this up now or after. Um, at one point, I know on the site plans, it showed there was four test pits. Um, I kind of mentioned it to Mr. Steele when we were out there, if we could observe them, and he said probably not. And then at further review on site plans, they're dated 2005. So just a follow-up question was, was there any newer test pits that were dug at the site, or is there an intent to do those before construction begins? No. No, okay. I, don't, I don't think it's necessary. The, the soils don't change. Uh, okay, that's fair. And, and again, I just didn't want to ask that question when we were on the walk, so I figured I'd save it for now. Um, and then the other... Well, I'll let Agent Collins go if he has anything to site walk specifically, and then I'll follow up with just another general question. Um, I'm just now looking at the rainwater report, and I just have one question about how wet was the um, right of way when you surveyed it? And how would your. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just now looking at the REMA report and the yes. pictures on. How wet was the right of way under the power line when you when that picture was Pretty taken wet. when it had logs? Yeah. And what vegetation is that that's subsequently grown up 
there just in the last few months? I, I have no idea because I haven't been there in the last two months. But what I no did notice when I was out there, um, when Wetland A was delineated also, and I did my, my walkthrough, my personal walkthrough. Obviously, other people from my company have also done walks, but for other reasons. And what I noticed that there's, and you can almost see it in that picture, that vehicles that have moved back and forth have basically compacted. And so you get a lot of wetness in those, those ruts. Um, but it, it's, it's a wet area because part of it is no evapotranspiration that's taking place there because there are no trees or shrubs because it's maintained more in a, in a more of a clearing. And so when that happens, that makes an area wetter by default. Does that mean it's, it's necessarily wetland? No. But it, it does look quite It, it even had logs along the edges of those ruts like they had used those for footing. So I, I guess I'm wondering, with your, with your um, plantings, what do you do when you get to that point? It's practically right there. And there you have the mess that they make. Plantings are up here, right? The plantings are within the, the green area that. Uh, mm. right. And the seed mix, the first seed mix on table 2-2 two -two <laughs> is going to be uh, within the water quality basin. So I wanted to, that's going to turn into a wetland. I and mean, even though there's a, there's a pilot yeah. a swale that goes through the middle, which is going to ensure that the only areas that are going to look wet are the ones that are in blue. Um, the, the groundwater, we realize, is not too, too far down, especially since you're, you're digging out a little bit. So um, it's going to end up being probably a wet area itself. But it's not necessarily wetlands. Not necessarily wetlands. Because it's, not the, wetland, it's not the soil type. Yeah. Right. It's not a wetland now. Soil. <laughs> right. It's not wetland soil. All right. So it's not a wetland. So what vegetation do you expect to, to spring up in there? Will that be something that you plant, um, or just what is there any? So the, the vegetation would be <coughs> probably similar to uh, the seed mix that we're putting down. There's 12 pounds of that. That's, that's a lot. There's probably going to be a nurse crop that's going to go with it, oh, depending on the time of the year, so that we have quick stabilization, whether that's annual ryegrass or winter rye or, or something. Um, and I don't have the, but this erosion control restoration mix for detention basins is for moist areas. I, I kind of ran out of room. It's for moist areas. And so a lot of the same kind of um, wetland plants that you will find in the wet mix are also in that one. But it's just a, a more robust uh, general kind of mix, not as much specialized as the wet mix that we're putting in the actual wetland mitigation area. It's like a trans transition, right? Yes, yeah, so it has, it has things that are do well in moist areas, wet areas, and somewhat transitional into upland areas. And um, So all, all those areas around the pond and the mitigation area are kind of be natural looking, not, yeah. not manicured lawns. Right. Yeah. So I'm sure the maintenance would be the kind of maintenance that you would expect and well, you're not going to let trees grow there and, and compromise the integrity of, of the detention basin. Usually we see cottonwoods come in quickly. <laughs> we need to cull those out quickly. Do you think that will fill in with cottonwoods there? No, we're not going to let that happen. That's the, that's the thing because that would will create an issue with uh, the functioning of the water quality basin. So now at the edges, it will depend on the uh, homeowners association, but I'm sure you have, Dana. You have specific best management practices for what they're supposed to do. Uh, not let trees to compromise the uh, the berm or the, the sides. Right. Yep. Well, thank you. You're, You're welcome. welcome, Chairwoman. I have a question, and and this might be for Georgie or you. I'm not sure. Um, I'm just taking a look at, or I looked at it earlier, but I'm taking another look at the past approval um, info that you um, gave to us. And I'm just curious, and maybe this is the right time to ask this question or not, but um, 17 years ago, is that, I mean, is there a, a statute of limitations on how long ago we look at? I mean, I realize we have past documents that we look at, but. That's why we're here, because it was so far ago. Um, right, can, can I, I understand that, but I'm just wondering 
excuse me, Commissioner Martin. Yes. Um, when you refer to 17 years, is that for? I'm referring to the, the former wetlands permit. And I realize that's the reason that they're here is because it expired. But I'm just uh, the. Oh, yeah, it's 2022. <laughs> My math's off. Like, wow, 17 yeah. years. I know. That's I, I thought the same thing. So I'm just wondering, Ooh. like. Maybe it's I'm just for my own mm -hmm. knowledge. How far back do we go? Because um, it was presented as a, a, you know, a coming back because it expired. Is there a, you know, a range of how long we? No, but it's that's that's what I'm asking. So in request yeah. an extension. They get the original approval of five years, five years. right then they that come I back know. i think it's twice right uh, no just another five ten oh, just another that's five. it so oh, okay. I apologize, so the but, permit is only allowed to be extended once um this is just because climate changes things move on um but in regards to looking at the history of properties when they apply again in the future you can go back infinitely it's good to go back until right. they were created um because as dana said earlier soils don't change um that's pretty much why okay that and that's part of my question is yeah. the information in this packet you're suggesting as we're discussing tonight and you are in your expertise that the soil hasn't changed from that 17 years ago from this document besides the fact of them finding that one additional wetland that wasn't mapped out before that's mm -hmm. pretty much it yeah. thank you thank you mm -hmm. Excuse me. In the last permit application, they had just put signs up around the wetland that you're making, saying it was wetland and flags, flags and stuff. Um, I kind of like that idea. Would you consider doing that again? Sure. <laughs> because we're, we are trying to educate the people. That's part of our POCD is what wetlands are. So if you could put flags around it, that's wetlands. And is that something that the town provides, or is something we'd have to come up with? Okay. Um, chair, what, that one. excuse me, Chair. Which condition the of the old permit are you referring to? Yeah, let me find it. Thought I had it marked. Oh, um, condition 12? Maybe. <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet. I'm just going to read it out loud for the applicant, just as a yeah. 17 years is a while. Yeah, it was a while. <laughs> um, the 50-foot no disturbance buffer area depicted on sheet 8 of 20 of the plans from 2005 shall be maintained by the entity that shall assume ownership of the common properties. It shall prohibit encroachment of unit owners' activities into this area. It shall be included in the management plan and documents transferred from the developers to the entity that shall assume ownership of the common properties. A copy of the final plans must be provided to the infill planning department before the agent may sign off on the first building permit. In order to maintain compliance with this permit, these documents must be filed. Um, blah, blah, blah. Signs to be provided by the developer shall be placed along the 50-foot non-disturbance boundaries surrounding the wetland. They shall read, quote, environmentally sensitive area, no dumping or vegetation removal, unquote. They shall be located one every 50 feet along the non-disturbance area. That was condition number 12 from the wetlands permit from 2005 for IW441. Yeah, so that's that's this line here. You can see where the vegetation is remaining yeah, yeah. around the wetlands. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we so would be happy to comply with that yeah. condition again. Yeah, thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Um, I do want to clarify something on my staff report, um, if I may. However, I do have one question for Mr. Steele, just to verify the, <laughs> the number of the new wetland mitigation area. So it was originally 4,300 square feet, and now you're proposing 6,375 square feet. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, I just wanted to verify that. Um, and then... For my site-specific recommendations, um, the first recommendation that states a qualified wetlands professional will be on site to supervise the creation, it's worded a little bit weird, so if you would like to reword that in a better manner, that's easy okay. to read, <laughs> I highly recommend it. 
Um, and then I also recommend adding another site-specific condition based off of what the soil scientist submitted because it is very important and we always recommend that the wetland soil scientist or some type of registered ecologist be there on site to monitor wetland mitigation. Um, so I also recommend in the note box that Mr. Logan presented that another site-specific condition be added that a pre-implementation meeting shall take place at least one month prior to plan implementation between the wetland scientist, the site contractor, and the landscaper and the town's wetland agent at the town's discretion. Having that site-specific ensures that that meeting takes place. We've had other applications in the past that also had this condition, but it wasn't set in stone because it didn't say a pre-implementation meeting will take place, so it kind of to a lot of confusion on a couple of sites that we've approved in the past so I would like to recommend that as well of course you may and you don't have to answer if you don't want <laughs> <laughs> but the 2005 plans I noticed the dates were going through March to April May were you in the area in the 2005 hurricane that flooded from, where, from I am, from Shaker Lake down through Jawbrook? Did you have any chance to observe what the right of way and what that area looked like subsequent to the 205? 20 no. year flood. I wasn't around with you. What's the right of way you're referring the, to? The power line thing. Oh, where, the power line. I'm looking at. No. The, I'm just, yeah, I'm very okay. curious what that whole area from the gravel pits down to Washington Road, how much flooding they experienced. It's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, I'm, I'm not refusing to answer. I just don't, <laughs> don't know. And those 20 year floods happen about every 20 years. So you might have been there and seen what that area was like in the 20 year flood. No? Yeah, that'd be, that'd be tough. That's not part of this. Um, yeah, just if you don't oh, yeah, want to do the, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. Madam Chair, I just got so one follow up question for the applicant. So actually, before I ask the question, I don't know, do, is that computer able to get on the internet? Just I'm trying to think there's a visual um, that I don't have. I don't know if you're able to get to the um, internet just to pull it up for the overlay. You want me to try? Are you looking for something specific? Yeah, so I'm looking for the um, Connecticut Deep, uh, I forget the abbreviation, but the Natural Diversity Database for oh, Enfield. Oh, yes. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're aware of the Natural <coughs> Diversity Database, and there are, some, there's, there are, there are some shaded areas on this property. Um, we were aware of that back in 2005 as well, um, and that's uh, something that is addressed um, the DEP requires us to address that, and George is going to be uh, is, is is working on that as well. So after local approvals, we have to go to the deep, deep and, and <laughs> deep is going to make sure that we're that we're not harming any endangered species or species of yeah. concern. Perfect. So yeah, and, and my question just again as as you're addressing is in um, Mr. Logan's report where he talks about um, wildlife um, effects from it. You know, there's a potential effect on wildlife with the disturbance with the wetland. So just looking at the overlay from deep, it looks like the shaded critical habitat does reflect the um, eastern wetland, the wetland A, um, towards the, the right side of the property, just based kind of on the image. I mean, it, it, you know, it's hard to tell off the site, but the approximate looks like that. So I just wanted to ask like, if there was further studies or observations on wildlife in the area and then leading into you know, the mitigation plan specifically for that critical habitat, you know, if it's using the wetlands as the habitat. Yeah, so the list, and I don't have <coughs> in, my, in my head completely, but it's mostly associated with the sandy area that's in the northern portion of the site. Um, which obviously has been disturbed by ATVs and motorcycles over the year. Um, and so what we're looking for, and right now that's why I mentioned that someone else from my company has been out there. Um, actually, she, you know, Sigrun Godwell, who's my uh, qualified botanist, has been out there looking at, at plants because there were, I think, three plants on the list, but they're all s s sort of sandy habitat, xeric plants. Um, there was one critical habitat, which is the New England marsh, but that doesn't occur on the site. We don't have a marsh on the site, so there's probably off-site somewhere, I'm not sure where. And then there was, um, I believe, 
six or seven um, invertebrates, mostly moths. Uh, so we actually have a, an entomologist that's been doing, if you went by the site and you saw some lights and you thought it was a UFO coming down, mm -hmm. that, was, that was the entomologist with his vapor lights and his mercury vapor lamps in a big, big sheet. <laughs> So he's been he's been out there I think once and he's going to be there this month and next month. Uh, we're going to collect all that data and that's going to be part of a report to the deep. Uh, my qualified botanist has been out already, and she told me yesterday she'd been keying all kinds of plants and she hasn't found anything that's listed or endangered at this point. But we're continuing our studies. But that's associated with the with a list of species that are known from the general area, and that's why you have those estimated habitats that overlap our, our site. I would like to add on, if I may, um, that the natural diversity database map that DEEP has made for all the Connecticut towns, um, they don't show the exact location of these critical or endangered species, their buffer areas, in order to protect them. Um, in order to really see where these critical habitats are, you have to request it through the state. Um, it's not information that's open to the public in order to keep them protected. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. We call them estimated habitats, but colloquially we call them blobs. <laughs> <laughs> They're blob maps, yes. General location. All right, just a question to staff then, to the chair. Can you pull up that image just to show kind of the, the overlay approximately where it looks as in relation to the site? Yeah, and, and that's the only reason I ask is like uh, the consultant said, it, you know, it's possibly the sandy area. It is hard to tell from this, um, but, you know, I just kind of want to make sure that that was addressed, um, you know, because perusing through the list, you know, obviously the plant life and then some animal life, I think it for this area too, it mentioned something about uh, some sort of tree frog could potentially, you know, reside in that. So I just, again, just to make sure the uh, diligence is being done in that. I don't know if you want to pass this down to the sure. members. Yeah, if I could just kind of re respond to that in general, that we're, our hands are somewhat tied in the procedural process that we have to go through. You're the first commission we come to. Then we go to planning and zoning. Then we go to deep, yeah. and that's the. It, we can't do it in any yeah, any other order. order. So <laughs> it behooves us to to hire people like George to know what deep is going to require to make sure our plans are going to more than likely be acceptable uh, to deep. And if we have to make changes, then we'll make changes. If those changes require us to come back, then we'll have to come back. But if we do it, if we do it right, then that that won't that won't happen. We'll, we'll get it right the first time and hopefully <laughs> I do want to point out that Deep is very thorough with protecting their critical and endangered species and they would not let this development go through if they found out that a species is feeling threatened or endangered. Correct. And I'll tell you that over the years they become even more stringent. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they, they have very specific specifications of what we have to do as, as specialists in whatever order of animal or plant we're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Is there any more? I just have one more question. Good. Have you ever seen the eastern spade-footed frog in any any area around here? Yeah, not around here, no. Um, we've looked for it, and I've done other things in, in the general area, in Enfield, for instance. Um, where we found them were, was, um, oh gosh, Griswold? Griswold. And down in Canterbury? Yeah, I think out in those areas, um, yeah. yeah, Canterbury was one of them. What does its field habitat, where it has its burrows? It likes use? it likes sandy habitats. This really isn't. Um, and it likes ephemeral, um, temporary water. Mm -hmm. it, it you wouldn't call it a vernal pool because they're even more ephemeral sometimes. And what, what's interesting with spade foot toad is uh, its its breeding is very very quick. 
It's right. just explosive. Um, so they'll come out at night for one night or two. They they breed, and they're uh, the larvae are probably the fastest growing larvae that we know, and so it's it's quite interesting. Uh, there are some some uh, specialists. I'm not. I'm a wildlife biologist. I don't necessarily specialize in spade for toad, but there are some uh, interesting studies that have been done in Connecticut, where actually uh, colleagues of mine have put uh, radio transmitters on spade for toads and then followed them around to see where they go, and they will dig down five or six feet. Mm. Just incredible. That deep. Mm -hmm. Thank you for answering that for, but it's not part of this. Uh, any more discussion on this application, regarding this application? Mm -mm. Okay. okay, I will make a motion <laughs> to approve IW number 665, 274, 284, and 242 Brainerd Road application for a wetlands permit for the development of a 42-unit multifamily housing with single detached homes, Washington Associates of Enfield LLC applicant, Washington Associates of Enfield LLC and Anthony Triano Jr. and John Petronella maps and, maps and lots 62 dash to 319, 77 to 67, and 77 to 68 R44 zone with our um, normal um, conditions and the following site specific conditions. Uh, number one, a qualified wetlands professional will be on site to supervise the creation of the replicated wetland area and its planting, seedings, and plant placement. Number two, snow stockpiling locations will be identified on the final plans. Uh, number three, the final plans will show the increased wetland mitigation area of 6,375 square feet. Number four, um, uh, environmentally sensitive uh, signage um, to be provided by the developer shall be placed along the 50-foot non-disturbance boundary surrounding the wetland. They shall read environmentally sensitive area, no dumping or vegetation removal. They shall be located one every 50 feet along the non-disturbance area. And number five, a site-specific pre-implementation uh, pre meeting shall take place at least one month prior to plan implementation between the wetland scientist, the site contractor, the landscaper, and the town's wetland agent at the town's discretion. Did I get them all? <laughs> Second. <clears throat> Any discussion? So, Madam Chair, just the only discussion. So I think that was a very well put together application. I do appreciate the applicant's responsiveness and willing to, willingness to address everything. Um, I just want to note that I will be abstaining. Um, the reason for that being I feel that there was some influence by staff that predetermined this application towards approval um, regarding the previous application being approved, trying to use that as a basis to approve it without doing our diligence. Um, and then I also have some concerns that they did try to impede the procedural process um, regarding contacting the application for a site walk um, and discussing on that. Thank you. Can I have anybody else? Roll call, please. Donna corbin Savinsky. Yes. Virginia Higley. Yes. Robert Hendrickson. Yes. Kevin Zorda. Yes. Phil Kober. Abstaining. Ann Collins. Yes. Nancy Martin. Yes. Six in favor, one abstain. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Give us a minute to... So just for the record, we always ask for previous um, approvals or denials or permits or whatever on applications because they are helpful in us to looking back what was approved and why or not approved and why. That is something we ask them to give us. So that is important to us 
because we did run into issues before. And I do want to clarify, I will never make a decision for you. And any decision you make is entirely up to you as the agency. My opinion is irrelevant. That's it's right. my job to give you all the information of the site that we have. <coughs> no, Madam Chair and, and staff, I do appreciate that. Um, Again, That's the way I, it's run. That's the way we do it. We want that information. We need that information. We got burnt a couple of times because we did not have the information. Yes, and I and I think that's very important. Um, but again, regarding the letter that was read earlier, there was a phrase: the applicant is only here because their permit expired, um, which leads to the perception that we would not fully review and evaluate this current application. The first time. That, that doesn't even make sense, that's but so whatever. Next on the agenda is IW 666-327 Brainerd Road, application for a wetland permit, and they're not here. I did talk to the site contractor who will be performing the work for the applicant. He told me that he will be here tonight. Um, not sure where he is now, but you still have time statutorily if you would like to continue it. Guess so. <laughs> so we'll keep it on the table. Um, can you just gentleman in the audience? Yeah, I know. I thought that was him. Um, I think maybe. he was the attorney for the past oh, applicant. Okay. Um, just for the notice of action, just um, please reiterate a new motion to keep it continued. Okay. All right. I'll make a motion to um, keep IW number 666-327 Brainerd Road tabled um, until the applicant appears before us. What's, what's his final date, by the way? Um, if, you, if you give me a little bit of time, I can calculate it out. Oh. Wait a minute. So it looks up. Because um, they have, you have 65 days to make a decision. Yeah. Um, and we received the application on. Yeah, it's been around for a little while. Used to be at the end of the. Uh, the first meeting in September, which was September 6th. Okay. So that means you have, they, the applicant has until, 30, at least until the end of November. Okay. I'll second the motion. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Kevin. Well, that would be like the first meeting in November. We'd have to make him, right? Yeah, we'll count, the days. we'll count out the I'll days. I'll count it out and I'll, okay. send, I'll remember and those. Maybe like put it on the. Yeah, you, so yep, I usually do calendars for every application. Um, I really expected the applicant to show up tonight. <laughs> um, but I'll have a calendar prepared for you and I'll email it out to you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, can we have a uh, vote on this? I just have a quick question. Can we deny the application at the next meeting if the applicant does not appear? Or do we have to just keep continuing it? Or do we hear it without the applicant? I think it would be prudent to hear, give them every opportunity to come. come. I recommend to never hear an application without the applicant. I've done that before. It backfired on me in court. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, in regards to denying them if they don't show up, I recommend to not do that. Just wait until the time clock runs out. The application is complete. There were some issues before if it not being complete. Um, they have an outstanding engineering comment, which is pretty important to whether or not how your decision goes. But it would not be uh, approved by default. Right? No. Okay. No, it would not that be approved by concern. default. Yeah. That's where wetlands and um, planning, and planning and zoning differ, is that even if you statutorily run out of time, it does not constitute an automatic approval. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, we would just that's, say yeah, that's good withdrawn just, or something. Yeah. We would just say. The, yes. Okay. Yeah, I think okay. so. I'll, I'll, uh, um, I'm going to verify that just to be sure. That's yeah, a question yeah. that do. you haven't you asked me yet. come up in a long time. That's <laughs> yeah. why I was just asking. No, I think we have to keep me on my toes. <laughs> I think we have to say we're withdrawing it or something. No, they have to ask so to withdraw they have to have to, uh, if they're not here. She'll, she'll check on it. I'll, I'll look into time. it. I've never okay. had that question okay, um, before. Vote. vote. Roll call to keep this tabled. Yes. Donna Corbin Savinsky. Yes. Virginia Higley. Yes. Robert Hendrickson. Yes. Kevin Zorda. Yes. Phil Kober. Yes. Ann Collins. Yes. Nancy Martin. Yes. Seven in favor. Motion passes. Uh, no new business. Then review of bylaws. <coughs> Oops. So um, I added. I changed the order of business for the agenda under Article 9 as requested. Um, I think that was the only thing that needed to be changed. Let me just verify. Phil had brought up something about changing the order of, um, what was that? Something. The agenda? 
No, it was just yeah. something a little confusing in one of them. Do you oh, remember yeah, what yeah. that was, Phil? Oh, uh, yeah, Mr. Oh, Vice yeah. Chair, I think it was the section regarding the virtual hybrid meetings, moving that to yeah. section oh. one. Okay. Just pretend it's there. I forgot to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Article uh, 7. Okay, Section 1, Article 7. All right, I will move that. That's my mistake. All right. Okay. So we'll just Anything we'll, else? We'll hold off on that. Okay. I think that was the only thing. Okay, I'll make those corrections, um, and I'll change the approval date to the next October meeting, and hopefully <laughs> that will be all. If you find anything else in the meantime, please don't hesitate Emailing. to contact me. Um, no new updates, however, the ZEO and I have started an Excel spreadsheet as, as you requested from the last couple of meetings as like an, an updated status and like a table of what was approved and what their current status is as a construction um, project. Um, however, we felt that residential projects um, were not needed to be included, you know, pools, sheds, decks. Um, however, large scale developments like Trinity Health, 3032 Bacon, Win Stanley, those are pretty important to keep up. Um, so just want to let you know that that's in the works. It's yep. almost done. Thank you. <laughs> I hope to give it to you guys um, in November sometime. Okay. Um, report of planning stuff? I do have one. Um, in your packets, you should have gotten this um, little okay. report with a picture of like a hand holding soil. Um, so that's Lori's hand. It's holding fine sandy soils and clay type soils. You can have my copy. Can you get these? Um, I'm just going to read it real quick before I give it to Rob. Um, the picture on the right shows the water table. Right now it's at its lowest. If you see in the picture the oxidized orange color, that's at its highest. Um, so these are the test pits that were supposed to be dug before construction started. Um, kind of like with our last developer, I asked about that site specific being added about pre-implementation meetings because there was some confusion for this project in particular that they did not do their test pits. However, we met on site with a soil scientist. He is currently monitoring all wetlands mitigation on site. Excuse me, I'm not sure what this is in. It oh, doesn't have a... It's yeah, it doesn't say what. Sorry, say it's where. 118 Hazard Ave, all American Thank you. And assisted okay. living. Assisted living. 118 Hazard. Thank that, you. Like across from Country yep. Diner, sorry. sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to put Thank the, you, George. That's pretty That's important. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's supposed to rain, like it was obviously it's raining all week. Um, and when Lori and I were leaving site, we realized that their silt fencing is failing in multiple yeah. areas. I sent them a warning email and have not heard a response um, that they need to repair the silt fencing immediately and that after the rain subsides, I will be back on site to ensure the silt fencing has been repaired and is functioning properly. Perfect. Yeah, that seems to be a common theme with these projects. Yeah. These larger projects. Yep, so um, we're keeping an eye on that one just because they're doing their wetlands mitigation part, and as we know, it's a very important and critical part of the project. Um, so I hope to be out on site next week to inspect that sill fencing and keep an eye on their mitigation. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Oh, can I just say, <laughs> this isn't a planning report, but can I just say before I forget that I went to the POCD meeting last week, and they stressed strongly the importance of wetlands and how uh, we as a town, it's part of our duty to guard the wetlands and to educate the people on the importance of wetlands. That is correct. Mm. Have you, um, has there been any, um, uh, has Rick or anybody gone out to the, uh, the site of the, um, the gas station. Noble the Gas? Yeah. Um, I do have an update for that. Yeah. They they recently applied for their demo permit from the building department to demolish that structure on site. Um, they got approval to clear the trees. That was the first step. Um, their wetlands permit was drafted and filed on land records. They got approval from planning and zoning, and now they've started the process of their demo permit. Um, they probably will not start construction until sometime next year, maybe the year after. Oh, wow. Oh. Wow. 
Yeah, because I, I didn't see any silt fencing. I mean, it's hard to see from the yep. road. It, but wouldn't, it wouldn't be up yet. Um, maybe give it a few more weeks. But they are supposed to notify us before they start doing work. Well, I mean, they, they've been doing site work well, there for... Maybe we phrase Before they start doing demo work. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, they've been doing a lot of site work for okay. a long time. But mm. I don't think I've seen any silt fencing. All right, let me um, just double check it just to make sure things are in working order. And if not, I'll send them an email. <coughs> Next is new applications. We have DPN 2022-0930-90 Elm Street, Raising Canes Restaurant. Yep, so this is an application for the development of Raising Canes, first on the East Coast in Connecticut, their restaurant out from Texas. Um, Adam Karachi is the applicant, Enfield Square Realty, LLC, Enfield CH, LLC, and Enfield Nassim, LLC owners, map 43, lot 28, BR zone. This is the last undeveloped lot in the mall area. Our GIS shows historic wetlands. However, they submitted a soil science letter that claims there are no wetlands on site and no significant impacts, hence why they applied for a determination of permit needed and they will be heard on the 18th right. sounds good next is miscellaneous so madam chair just two things i probably would have been more on our agent correspondence but maybe for discussing um either to consider a subcommittee or an agenda item to review the municipal wetland regulations that we have um it looks like the last updates 2020 um, and as we identified, I think there's some opportunities to add or clarify things in the regulations. Um, so again, either establish a subcommittee um, and or add it as an agenda item to uh, the bylaws. We, review them, uh, we review, review them as a whole board. Okay. So, so again, this is just yeah. bringing the idea that yeah. we review them potentially we, adding We review that. them every couple of years. Okay. The whole board. It's in, the bylaws. It's in our bylaws. Yeah. And when will that be? Use our organizational meetings. No. It's every every even year you do bylaws and regulations. Um, if you do plan on changing anything in the regulations, it is a public hearing. I right. just want to put that out there. Right. Okay, so if it is in the organizational meeting and we didn't do it in September, mm. are we adding it to the agenda? I guess is my question. It's not September. Next year. Yeah, that's Even or odd years. For it's that. supposed to be even. You just said even. even. Yeah. Yeah. Just even. yeah. So that would have been this September. Yeah, we did the oh, bylaws. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we I thought you meant We did the bylaws. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we usually do the regulations every few years, and Georgie goes out and gets yep. the new ones for us, and then we discuss them. And she a gets <coughs> to I actually, I do not believe that our regulations have been looked at because the bylaws only mention review of bylaws. Right. Yes. Yeah, I think I think it's been a while yeah. since it so has it's and probably pertinent to do. Yeah, yeah so yeah. Um, if every municipality, all regulations for any land use commission are mostly <coughs> modeled after the state regulations. And it's up to the jurisdiction of that municipality to edit those regulations as see fit per their town. Um, so you do have jurisdiction to update these regulations. Right. And I do agree with Commissioner Colbert that they are in need of some serious updating. Yeah, They're yeah. pretty old. Um, and the language is kind of not really good for the public. Um, so if you would like to do that, we can do that. And I can put on the agenda for next meeting. Or <coughs> well, you need time to get the. Yeah, if you can pull the updated versions. You should have them in your binders. That should be the most recent regulations in your binders. Oh, well, ours. Ours. Yeah. 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 Your commission from the state. From Is the there state? any updates oh. from the state? That, oh. No. No, the okay. state doesn't really update their wetlands regulations. Um, they'll update their statutes and their right. watercourse act, but they won't really update the regulations themselves unless something pops up in court. Um, but I'll verify just to make sure that yeah. there haven't been any updates because you never know of deep. That's what we follow as well. Yep. Um, so <laughs> it'll probably take us a while to go through those for sure. Yeah, so. exactly. And that's yeah. again, I know we'd yeah. vote on them as a full committee. I didn't know if we wanted to think of changes in the subcommittee yeah. and then bring it forward again. This yeah, we is do kind it of, as a, yeah. we do it as a yeah, full board. We'll do it as a full board. Um, so maybe we can put it on the agenda for next. We'll just kind of keep it on until like we get it done. Yeah. All right, let me just um, review the public hearing process because I'm not sure if you have to open the public hearing while you review it or if you discuss review. I, so. I just want to make sure because I was going through it today for map amendments and that popped up in the state statutes. So I just want to read it one more time before we decide on a date to review them. I think once we decide what we're going to change, so mm -hmm. we would okay. I'm pretty sure too, but I, I just want to cover. Staff the is, but maybe you could get a couple towns copies of their bylaws. Okay, to see what so they I, have. I'm gonna um, put this out there then, since that got brought up. Um, 
So I've been actually talking to a lot of Connecticut towns these past few weeks. I've been talking to their wetlands <coughs> agents because there's been some, there's a lot of confusion with map amendments per se. I just want to put that out there because I know we're starting, if we're going to update our regs, we should really update our map. Um, so I, I just want to reiterate our, what our regs say about map amendments compared to the statutes, compared to a couple of responses I got for some towns that I think are actually really good for us to implement. Um, so basically, I sent this giant email out to the Connecticut listserv for planners, wetlands agents, CEOs, and attorneys asking about how do these other towns do their map amendments because our practice has been like an automatic de facto. If we get a soil science report from a developer, we accept it as their map amendment, they get approved, but the map doesn't officially change because all map amendments are required for public hearings. The applicant has to file um, a new delineation map in town clerk 10 days prior. It gets filed again in 10 days in the town clerk after it gets approved by the Weltons agency. Um, so in section three of our Weltons regs, 3.3, the agency shall maintain a current inventory of regulated areas within the town. The agency may amend its map as more accurate information becomes available, which is what we've been doing. Um, 3.1, the agency may use photography, remote sensing imagery, resource mapping, soil map, site inspection observations, or other information in determining the location of the boundaries of wetlands and watercourses. Just note the word determining. Um, 15.6, water courses shall be delineated by a soil scientist, geologist, ecologist, or other qualified individual. <laughs> Delineations conducted during frozen ground or snow cover conditions will not be accepted. Wetland delineation shall not be reviewed by the agency during frozen ground or snow covered conditions. 15.9, agency makes a decision in writing the reasons why the change to the map was made. That's very important to note. In the state statutes, section 22A 42A, parentheses A, parentheses 1, the manner in which the boundaries of the wetland and watercourse areas in the municipality shall be established and amended or changed. Basically, the municipality's wetlands agency has a jurisdiction to change this map. There's no statutory requirements to how, when, or why. Um, so with that being said, um, I got one response from the town of Newington, Eric Hinkley, who's their AZT, their ZEO, and their wetland agent. Um, this was the first one that I started working on. There's a couple others that I haven't printed out yet, because um, I'm still compiling some research. His response to my question, Georgie, as you point out, you can't amend the map without a public hearing. Newington gets many applications where they don't go through the map amendment process, but the wetlands are flagged and a report is delivered, kind of similar to Enfield. The commission accepts these, past practice long before I was here, similar to us. What I have started doing is adding these flagged wetland lines to our GIS as a separate layer and calling them flagged wetlands. We keep the town lines and we can see the flagged ones as well. A future application in that area will show the flagged wetlands and may expedite that application. In review of our town attorney, it was recommended that the commission could hold a yearly public hearing to amend the map where these types of applications have been accepted. I have yet to try that option at this point. I can see some potential issues if the public has a question and no soil scientist is there to respond or discuss. We are currently without a GIS technician at this time and I no longer have access to update my Wellens maps. Otherwise, our GIS person or myself would update our maps as needed. Let me know if you have any other questions. Um, what we liked most about this response was the yearly approval of the map amendments, that which that would idea. actually, Absolutely. that would work really well for us because we have so many wetland delineation maps already that we could hold a public hearing on and implement them as an official wetlands map. Um, I am the GIS specialist for our department, so I would be able to add those flagged layers onto our GIS, um, however, Enfield used to have a GIS technician um, and they left the town a few years back. We don't have a new one just yet. Um, so I don't have access to the old wetlands layer, but what I can do is re-digitize a new layer, which might take me a couple of weeks because <laughs> we're currently updating from ArcMap to ArcMap Pro, which is a completely different GIS software. It's a lot more complicated, but also gives us much more flexibility in our mapping. Um, so for example, if the commission ever got a grant in the future or whatever to hire 
um, a flyover that would be tied into our new GIS system and we would be able to do new advanced mapping. Um, just putting that out there. But I am working on more research to get for the, for the agency in regards to the map amendment process because we really should be implementing our map amendments. But then again, if you add it as a site specific condition and the development is built and they didn't do the map amendment, there isn't really a good way to enforce the applicant to come before you for that map amendment procedure. Um, besides revoking their wetlands permit, which if it was a development, wouldn't really make sense. Um, so it's in the works. Yeah. <laughs> I hope to have more answers for you before the meeting in November. And I think the first meeting you came to, we talked about getting a, a drone. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> thank you, George, I'd just like to say thank you for that work. Yeah. Um, the people of the town of Enfield should appreciate your efforts and your staff's efforts on that. Yeah, long overdue. Because that's important business. It, it is long you. overdue, and it's very important yeah. because as the Wetlands Commission, you, your basic duty is to protect the wetlands. Um, and of course, you know, that varies depending on application, regulated activity, so forth. Um, but having this type of education available for the public can also help developers, which yeah. we can also do things like doing some type of updated PowerPoint presentation on erodible soils in escarpments because we have our last erosion PowerPoint is from like 2008 yeah. so, so we should um, update those so, so do you have access now or no you will not to the GI not to the wetlands layer because it was a historic layer that we don't have the database that in, G in the GIS world we call it the red exclamation point of death where your uh. data does not connect which means that the GIS software cannot find that layer uh. so it's in the so we're getting new software though you said we're getting a new software. It's, it's there, you just can't connect to it. It's gone. It's literally like in the space of never being able to be found again. So what I would have to do then is re-digitize that entire layer for the town, which can take a long time. But now that we're updating ourselves to ArcMap Pro, it's a lot faster and smoother. Oh, good, good. So I hope that it'll be a little bit easier. Yeah, well, that'd be good. Super. Thank you. Yeah, I know, because you keep saying you didn't have access. It's like, can we get you access? <laughs> yeah, ArcMap, it, it crashes on you probably like every 10 minutes, especially when you're doing layer editing. It's very picky, and it's even picky with names. If you don't name a layer the right name, it won't load. Red exclamation point of death. Yeah. So maybe I should have got my master's in urban planning instead of GIS, but here I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, Madam Chair, just one other thing for miscellaneous then that I kind of made a note on that we could highlight. Um, so several of us attended the town attorney's introduction to land use training earlier in September. I think that was a really good jumping off point. I think the determination was we don't necessarily have to do the same training as right. um, PNZ and ZBA. Um, one of the opportunities, too, I think we could work on would probably be FOIA training. Um, so I would make a recommendation that we reach out to the state FOIC and they do a public education officer um, that comes out to towns. Uh, I know they've been at Enfield before. They went to JFK a few years ago. Um, and I think that would be good to connect to and, and have that training as well. Now, the town attorneys have offered to give us more training okay. Yeah, okay. at that meeting. So they'll be coming up with more training that we can attend. <coughs> yeah, maybe you can reach out to the state. And, yep, I know and, the, the state representative for FOIA after going to Casio, so I can reach out to him. Yeah. And Khaki Wick is is a good one too. There's, yeah, a, lot there's, good, there's a lot of good. Although stuff. they they're they're moving away from kind of our stuff to yeah. more yeah. environmental stuff, or not even. It's I just think yes. some of the, yeah, I was disappointed in the choices this year, um, with yeah. uh, uh, pertinent to our you know Game agency. Wells, yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of Kakiwick, did everybody email Jennifer McKenzie if you wanted to attend or not? There is money in the budget for conferences. Um, sh she should have sent you like this um, did, list yeah. of the sessions that you can join, and you pick which ones you want. If you she haven't, had to get it back to her yesterday. Yeah, if you haven't done that yet and you still want to do, just email it to her tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they're like they're, ASAP. They'll take you still. Just because we have to put a PO in with the finance department, so it could take a little bit of time, and I don't want you to miss the the conference. The deadline, yeah, yeah, it's October 29th in in New Haven. Yeah, it's farther away. Farther and if, away. if you don't want to attend this year, you can always attend next year. Yeah, that's always a good one. The there are also other the, conferences. The keynote speaker last year was incredible. About he was a. Um, it was about flooding and flooding. how that's going to continue and get worse, and that was that was eye-opening. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 If that's a recorded session somewhere, that would be good to. Did you have nightmares? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 830.